I, I genuinely think there's a good chance I wouldn't have succeeded if I'd got funding because really? I think it'd just be too easy to waste it on on stupid things like advertising, you know, and, and I wasn't experienced enough to know what was the best thing to spend on in that sense mm. at that point. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We are joined by Rupert Hunt, founder of Spare Room. Uh, thank you for joining us, Rupert. Thank you. So I actually reached out to you on account of the fact that I am currently using Spare Room, um, and I'm a delighted user, to say to say the least. Uh, but what we wanted to find out today to give some context to our audience was um, you, you started of your own admission by somebody who was stacking shelves and doing a, a Mickey Mouse degree, and that's your words, not, not mine. <laughs> um, and then you've gone on to start this amazing business that's extraordinarily successful. Um, so we would love to hear your journey from, from how it began back in those days of, of stacking shelves and then take us forward into to how you started uh, Spare Room. Sure. Um, so it, it probably all started back, you know, doing my Mickey Mouse degree, which was in pop music, believe it or not. <laughs> um, not as in Top of the Pops kind of hit parade music. That means as in popular 20th century music as it was then. Um, and I, you know, was in a band uh, called Erogenous Jones back then. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be the best band name. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and my surname is Jones. So, um, <laughs> I'd quite like to be referred to as Erogenous Jones. <laughs> yeah, what, what was the making of that name? <laughs> God, I can't remember now. Um, it's very but, uh, was there anybody called Jones or was there any uh, particular fascination I with the Erogenous? the only connection I can think of is we're all into Counting Crows and there was a song we loved called Mr. Jones. I don't know if that inspired it, but I don't think there's any particular story. We just like the wordplay. Um, so, but anyway, the, the band will come back into the story uh, shortly. But uh, in my third year, we were given various modules, optional modules to do. And one of them was uh, the internet, which was very much in its infancy back then. Uh, this was the uh, late 90s. Mm. And I did that and uh, you know, built my first website and got very excited by the whole thing, um, sort of started dreaming up business ideas um, and, yeah, just got more into it. Um, meanwhile, we graduated and moved down to London to try and make it big in this band. Um, by then, we were, we'd renamed ourselves uh, Leonard, which I don't think was a far inferior name, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and tried to make it big, but in in the process, I sort of experienced finding uh, you know a flat back then with them, and the sort of the struggle that, that was when, you know, in those days it was primarily uh, classified ads in a newspaper called the Loot, mm. um, and I also at the t same time my girlfriend moved down and she moved into a, a flat share, um, so I was I was living with friends, but she moved into a flat share, so I sort of experienced firsthand her experience doing that. And meeting, you know, these strangers through the loot, um, and I guess that was the first time I thought, God, this could obviously be done a lot better online. It seemed like a very natural thing to do. So um, I got a job stacking shelves, and in my spare time, I started working for free for a local entrepreneur uh, with his website to gain experience. Eventually, got a job in a web development agency. Um, learned more and more and started building this site in my spare time which at the time was called into london.com mm. um, and it was originally intended as sales and lettings and um, I spent many months developing these very clever features uh, uh, <laughs> and you know designing the perfect interface and on the last afternoon before I launched bolted on a flat share notice board as kind of a bit of an afterthought to be honest um, and I launched and not a lot of actually happened <laughs> but slowly over time with the sort of seo skills i picked up at work um the flash i know it's board started getting traction um which was very frustrating given all the effort i put into the rest of it um but i started focusing on that more and sort of iterating it on it sort of talking to users and eventually canned the rest um and it was around that time i decided to leave my job and move back home to manchester mm -hmm. to my mum and dad's farm what happened uh, to the band at this point? Oh, yeah, so uh, mm. by that point, we'd sort of uh, accepted that rock stardom wasn't coming our right. way. Well, what, <laughs> what were you in the band? <laughs> I was bass and backing vocals. And okay. we, we did have a, a narrow brush with fame. We, uh, we were played by John Peel, 
um, and were a, a sort of a favourite of Bob Geldof on XFM for about two weeks. He played us every day, so we were nice. getting very excited. But yeah, it didn't turn into anything, unfortunately. But but in a way, like maybe the timing wasn't right because now people go into the John Peel stage at Glastonbury, and suddenly if they get a good fan base there, they can go through the stages of Glastonbury and then hit Frank yeah. Stardom or, or whatever it might be. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if John Peel liked you, it seems reasonable that he'd, he'd do that. Yeah. Um, so you then went back up to how come you relocated to Manchester given that so much of the activity of the site was focused on London yeah good question I mean I suppose I got fed up with the job I was at Um, I was coming out of a long term relationship Um, I'm just struggling to get by really sort of with money and I just thought if I want to I wanted to focus on doing my own thing initially it was I was thinking I'll try and make something of the Inter London site but also I'll do some freelance web design and it just seemed like oh this a, a more realistic way of doing it because I could, you know, live cheaply at home and, um, you know, mm. live off home cooked dinners and everything. Um, so, original bootstrapping. Good. Yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and it was, yeah, really, uh, yeah, it was uh, really, I'm really glad I did it because, yeah, it allowed me to, to sort of get on my, my feet with, with those things. And slowly, you know, insulin and, you know, gathered more momentum and I decided to start trying to charge for it. Because back then, the sort of the normal way of making money on sites was selling advertising, but mm. but no one could make it work really. It was just you couldn't make anything out of that. So I thought. Um, so it was around that time I think Friends Reunited came out, and they were quite unusual, and they uh, charged a subscription to contacts for your school friends. Mm-hmm. I think it was five pounds for a lifetime membership at the time. Um, so I just nick their idea and I started charging five pounds for a lifetime membership of Inter London uh, so that was uh, you know my first sort of commercial step with the site and it started to really pick up um, I also noticed when I got back that you know the Leap newspaper existed in Manchester and people were sharing there and thought right let's you know I should make this national and so dreamt up spare room and launched that in that first year back home um, was that just you sorry. Yeah, just me at the time. Um, I hired my first person uh, during that first year back at home. Um, kind of a, a, a friend of a, no, sorry, the girlfriend of a family friend. Um, we literally not, we hadn't seen him for a few years, so we went out for a beer and met his new girlfriend. And she said she was working a lettings agent. And I told her what I was doing, and she told me her idea for an event called Speed Flat Mating, where you yes. find a flatmate through speed dating. I thought, wow, that's an amazing idea. Come and work for me and we'll do it. Um, so, she, yeah, she took a real a real leap of faith with me, left this job uh, when I couldn't afford to pay myself, never mind her, but I, I could see the kind of numbers, you know, on the increase, and I said, well, I, th- I think by the end of this month I should have enough to pay you. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> I did. Um, but, yeah, she, she joined, and we launched Spare Room uh, together, and... Uh, did our first speed flat mating event in London as well, which was another sort of... I think quite, Clapham. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, very small event. I think we only got six people to turn up and, and one journalist from something like the Wandsworth Gazette, so mm. a bit disappointing. <laughs> uh, but they ran the article and to our <laughs> delight, uh, the Times rang saying, when's your next event? We want to cover it. So we lied thursday and quickly cobbled something together before they changed their mind yeah. <laughs> and uh somehow managed to pull this event together in islington and it they covered it i think it was a saturday property section and then it just went ballistic it was sort really of the third event we had two tv crews five radio stations and i think nine journalists there and just the two of us trying to run this busy event <laughs> and <laughs> this is that without any like targeted pr outreach on your part they were they were coming to you no this has come off the back of uh, the times and the ones with gazette or whatever it was came off the back of um we basically paid this freelancer 100 quid to do a press release based on a survey we'd done and in the editor's notes just mentioned oh and we run speed flat mating events yeah and they picked up on that and came to that so it was all <laughs> well, how, how, good 100 quid <laughs> yeah <laughs> did, with, that, with that quick quickly run event did you load that with friends and family or did you just manage to get a good a good turnout the first one, um, the one, the one where the times came. Uh, the first and the second one, I have to confess, there was a couple of rent crowd. Yeah, uh, <sighs> so a couple of friends who you know came to pet out numbers. But uh. <laughs> but it's so funny because mm, those things 
the need was there. It just mm. needed to be communicated through the relevant channels because it, it wouldn't have exploded had there not been yeah, such yeah. a demand for it. So whether you padded it out or not, it, it's incredibly useful yeah, yeah, service. Absolutely. And what, what sort of explosion did you see on the the, the web traffic after? I guess after the TV. Yeah, TV. I mean, there was. It, it certainly was great for word of mouth. I don't think. It, I mean, in terms <coughs> of translating to traffic, I, I can't say it. it it was transformative in that sense. Right. It was definitely more the word of mouth, and obviously, sort of links from, you know, newspapers and so on would you know really help the SEO. I guess um, credibility on the website yeah. in terms of when you put publication featured in the yeah, Times, exactly. it makes people feel a bit safer about using the platform. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because presumably, you weren't spending uh, any money on you know PPC. I mean, was there PPC? And I think that started. 2007 well at least that was I think when I first tried it but yeah we didn't I mean I had no money really yeah, I yeah. think I had I think I bought the domain for about $2,000 and basically maxed out a credit card for about 5000 and hmm. it just had to be very resourceful and creative with how we grew the site so the sort of things I did was well SEO was a big one which I sort of got good at through work um, but we did things like so the loot newspaper we used to resell um, branded spots in there, which was a good deal for them and covered our advertising costs. So it was a sort of, it was almost like a bolt on advertising package, you know, get your That's room in the loot, but also got our branding on it. And did the loot not realize you were sort of eating them from the inside? <laughs> no, I okay. they did, or, or at least it took too long to realize. <laughs> <laughs> what is this spare room dot com? Yeah, it's like, no, no. wow, the Trojan horse is, yeah. is there to be seen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, stuff like that. But it's like being mentioned a lot, but sometimes when businesses are cash strapped is when they are their most creative. So, you yeah, know, that's good. And then you, you're pretty robust in the way you grow rather than stumbling over yourself. And absolutely, yeah, and just yeah, not spending too much on unnecessary things. I, I genuinely think there's a good chance I wouldn't have succeeded if I'd got funding because really? I think it'd just be too easy to waste it on. Um, on stupid things like advertising, you know, and, and I wasn't experienced enough to know what was the best thing to spend on in that sense mm. at that point. Well, so. did, did you know how the funnel was operating? Because um, it, it's a bit like Angel Investment Network. So we, we bring investors and entrepreneurs together to, to talk. Mm. We don't follow it through down to then see how many invest into each company because it, it goes off platform. So in the early days, mm, obviously, we're getting a lot of people looking at the site, but were you aware of how much, how much successful renting was going on? Um, right from the get-go as in were people quite happy to use the internet just to share and let their rooms or were they sort of going on there to, to browse and get familiar with it hmm, good question um, I I mean they seemed pretty comfortable with it really um, it certainly wasn't I don't think we were the first to do it by any means there was actually an existing um, competitor there that a lot of people were using um, who but, was that so easy roommate they were okay. um, yeah they were had become big in America and France and were fairly well established in the UK but we sort of yeah sort of a bit of competitive kind of um, yeah in the early days but uh, we sort of quickly left them behind <laughs> so, which well it's like it's like the thing with, with Craigslist like phenomenally successful mm -hmm. but when you first looked at it it was like well, I'm not sure if I can trust this and Gumtree similarly it was like I, I'm sort of venturing into the unknown but yeah. all, all three of you have gone on to have great success by almost just delivering a simple and a highly effective yeah. model. Um, did you have designs to sort of complicate the platform more, but actually just found that the traction kept on rewarding you for focusing on this sort of simple experience that you, you guys deliver? Yeah, and the sort of, and a lot of what we, you know, the experience we built was based on this sort of constant feedback loop with the users. Because in the early days, I was literally sat next to uh, my first employee, Gemma, and you know she'd have phone you know she was doing the customer services she'd have a phone call and then she'd say can we do that yeah all right mm -hmm. just give me a few minutes and then by the, <laughs> by the evening it was released and she'd ask oh does that does that work for you now so uh yeah it was kind of quite finely tuned in the early days in that sense um but yeah it's just uh, as a model it works we don't want to overcomplicate it i mean we're, we're sort of in terms of the future we're looking at uh how we can better um predict compatibility you know we're looking more at the people side of it i think that's the sort of the next sort of important thing to look at um although before that this year we're looking more into uh, the trust and safety th sort of side of things how we can improve um trust on the on the service um through verification and 
uh, and also get involved with the, the transactional side of it. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, for the very few listeners who, who don't know, who haven't heard of Spare Room, <laughs> can you explain exactly what it, what it is? Um, so simply uh, a platform where people with rooms to rent can find people looking for, for rooms to rent. Uh, and so if you, if, if you're, uh, if you have a room and, and this includes sort of, we have agents advertising, landlords, uh, live-in landlords as we call them, i.e. homeowners looking for lodgers, uh, and also groups of sharers who perhaps have, have lost, one of their friends have dropped out mm -hmm. and they need to fill a room. And you can place an advert for free, um, or there are upgrades available, which, you know, in a nutshell, gives you more choice and, and a faster result. Um, and similarly, if you're looking, um, you might also want to advertise your your requirements. Um, again, you can use it for free, but there are upgrades to, you know, get more so, content. So it's free for on both sides of the marketplace, yeah. but there are paid options available. Yeah. Okay. So it's a you know, most people use it for free, but um, it's. You know, a small percentage of a large amount of people um, upgrade. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, we upgraded when we were trying to get somebody to, f to stand into a room with ours, and yeah. it gives you probably four times as many candidates quicker. So, if you're anxious right. about a room coming up free in a month's time, then yeah. it, for us, it was worth it just to remove that that worry. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and it, the, the results, yeah, it's, it's actually it's actually staggering how quickly things happen. Um, we <laughs> we interviewed people back to back for three days, and then on the third day we'd, we'd chosen our person and mm. the problem was solved yeah. and actually not it doesn't cost very much money either yeah um but i have noticed more recently the sort of professional users of it which are these almost like management companies that are obviously very good at getting putting together professional house shares yes and getting people in and out quite uh, effectively and then um they're almost like much more fit for purpose than the standard estate agents trying to let rooms because they yeah. allow you to be more dynamic for instance you don't have these huge deposits and um, you have shorter terms, you can go for four months. Did these companies exist before Spare Room? Or have you created a sort of little meta industry? I, I, yeah, I think, I think so. Spare Room did yeah, help create that industry, definitely. Um, yeah, we've certainly seen it uh, emerge while we've been around, put it that way. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and like you say, some of them are just so much you know, more focused on that experience. The fact, you know, a lot of them are... Uh, introducing you to flatmates as part of the process, and they almost get involved with the selection process, which yeah. you know is good for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's, people will stay together longer if they if they're right. And when did you suspect that that this really was a, a hit? <laughs> when did I suspect? Um, I mean, it's it's been surprisingly successful from even the early days, and you know we came we became profitable almost straight away and it's grown strongly since and you know continues to surprise me and you know it's yeah I reckon with the probably within the first year it was like wow okay this is really so when did you like a, you know <laughs> a good thing <laughs> when did you start hiring people in addition to, to general um, so the, the the next hires were mostly um, to help with the customer service side of it that yeah. was probably the most um, yeah the main requirements early on I probably didn't hire soon enough on the technology side I ended up you know doing a lot of that myself for too long mm. um, which I think was in some ways was really good and powerful it meant we could sort of adapt very quickly mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it was but uh, over time it, it beca I became a bottleneck and you know it was very and it was became harder to, 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 to on board would it be fair to call you a, a single founder I know you brought in Gemma quite early, but did she take on a, a legitimate co-founder role or did you find that you, you were the single founder? Because that's very stressful from what I understand. Yeah, I mean, it certainly was, yeah, sort of a lonely position. I mean, I, yeah, technically I was a single founder, although, uh, you know, I feel like she was almost, you know, almost like a co-founder right. yeah, and certainly has been my confidant and sort of, you know, best person I've ever hired. You know, in, she's in still many there. Respects. Yeah, she's still there, so she's still... Um, yeah, and, and in terms of what you said with the tech bottleneck, was there a point in time where you've completely overhauled the the tech stack or the build of the of the spare room platform, or has it still got some of your original handiwork? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's still some of it in there. Um, <laughs> several times over the years, we've uh, you know, so many of the developers who've come in, said, oh, you should, uh, we should completely rebuild, rebuild this from Don't scratch. Don't touch it. <laughs> yeah, but and and it has been tempting, and, and but we've been warned not to do it by our competitor who did it and it went very wrong and really? I think just to re recreate something that 
is actually the the sort of sum of many years of, of work and experience is quite difficult uh, but we have um, we are making ourselves less reliant on the original code base we're turning you know that into the sort of core API so that we're then more flexible in terms of how we uh, consume that sort of on the web and on the apps as well so, so. But then why do you think that you beat your competitor um, I I think there are a number of things. Uh, so Easy Roommate were um, had a very much a walled garden um, approach. They weren't very open about what the content was there, whereas we always wanted to be more transparent. And I think that was good for the user. I think it was good for SEO. Um, and I think it's a better name <laughs> for a start. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and, and you presumably knew that when you were willing to fork out $2,000 for that yeah, domain. Yeah. Yeah, and it's lucky I did because I, 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 it was on one of these. Uh, You're good at naming things. <laughs> <laughs> it was on some domain sort of selling website, and uh, and I inquired about it. And it, as soon as I inquired it, it kind of unlocked the price. And so suddenly that <sighs> domain was now saying two thousand dollars. Oh god! Uh, and after about a week, I thought, now I'm going to get it. So I got it, and literally two hours later, I got a call from some guy in America saying. Did you just buy spareroom.com? I said, yeah. He said, oh, I've been watching that for, for weeks, wondering whether to get it. And it turned out he owned a, a storage company called Spare Room and was obviously a bit gutted that he hadn't acted quick. <laughs> well, did, well, did you not quote him a price and say it's yours for 10000 <laughs> I wonder what he's doing yeah. now. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> he still occasionally Googles <laughs> wistfully spareroom.com. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, sus I suspect that would have would have helped. Um, and and any well, anything else that you think that, that helped you? Um, I I think some of the just the, those growth strategies that we sort of touched on in the early days. Um, you know, they had a lot more money behind them, so perhaps they weren't spending their money as wisely. Mm. Um, but, um, Were you given advice? Did you, did you ever get because as a first time founder and um, coming from, I guess not particularly a business background mm. um did you get like startups today they like to get you know official sounding advisors yeah. who presumably give them good advice yeah. did you do that is that how you came up with the strategies or was it just being creative no it was just me i mean a bit like the, you know i was saying earlier about the um funding not really being on my radar mm. and sort of in terms of the advice available there just wasn't the same advice around mm. at that point um i got got some advice from my dad <laughs> yeah um, it's always a good pool of people. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after a few years I, I started um, following a, a sort of bit of a marketing expert who used to send out a monthly CD of advice which you know mm -hmm. he used to send out a CD yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah cool <laughs> yeah. I like it yeah. the hell is a CD <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, that actually, so, so part of your growth journey that I am also excited to explore is um, why I know somebody who, who worked, founded Living Social, and for them, the, the emergence of social networks, as you've alluded to, uh, yeah. with Friends Reunited and stuff, was an important growth strategy for them. And similarly, you've gone into mobile. So, um, did you leverage any of the social platforms at an opportune time to get in and, and get an audience from them? To be honest, I've always we always struggled with. Yeah, sort of leveraging a social platform. We always thought that you know, in, you know, it, it certainly seemed like there should be opportunities there. But the few ideas we tried, I wouldn't say, were particularly successful or pivotal in our journey. Um, I mean, for a while we we used it as part of the uh, the product functionality, like sort of showing rooms who you know um, were placed by friends or friends of friends, which. You know, I think people liked, but it was, I don't know, I'm not, not sure it had a huge utility, really. Um, so, no. No, and, <laughs> and and then transition to mobile, I mean, obviously. Yeah, mobile, I think we, I'm, I'm pleased that we did that. When, what, we did when did it. you do that? So, uh, we launched our iPhone app in 2011. Okay. Um, and, yeah, which was, you know. In hindsight, sort of quite early on, and I'm, you know, and our, certainly our competitors were very slow to catch up. They, they did release one that was just so buggy they ended up uh, withdrawing it. Um, uh, what we were a bit more slow on was mobile web. That that sort of crept up on us. The kind of move to mobile web. Um, we'd always sort of give the desktop site a lot of love, um, but the mobile was a bit of a oh, 
you know, when we started it, it was very few people using it. And, you know, we quickly saw, we slowly saw, oh my God, how many people are on here? And it's obviously affecting conversion rates and so on. So that's obviously now, you know, mobile first is a, you know, almost a cliche and it's sort of, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah very much at the center of what we do now. And what's your opinion in terms of, you mentioned about reputational sort of aspects of uh, spare room, of bringing in, because there's, is it roomy? Um, and I guess where they're going with it is trying to sort of bring in the personality of the person you're dealing with more. It's like it's more like you can f- find out who they are and a bit more about them. Yeah. Where's your opinion on where that it's too intrusive to sort of give backgrounds on the the potential person you're renting with versus actually what people want the information on? Mm. Uh, so backgrounds in terms of like just their profile, like yeah, yeah. G- gimmicky stuff about them, because it's it's. I found that with some people on, on Spare Room, I mean, they'll flesh that out and I kind of mm. get an idea from them. Most people actually just put it in the advert, which I think is yeah. perfectly suitable. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering if you had designs to sort of bring in that aspect a bit more. Yeah, we're certainly looking into that. Though. Yeah, um, the sort of the compatibility thing, people matching is, you know, very much a, you know, a big part of how we see the future of Spare Room. But it's kind of finding the right way of doing it. Cause it's complicated. Yeah, because I mean, the obvious thing to do is to I don't know match people on shared interests, but I don't think that really, you know, it's a good icebreaker, and it might, you know, be something you you bond on in some respects, but it very rarely defines a relationship. You know, yeah, whether it's flatmates, friends, or romantic. So it's kind of, and often it's your differences that are, are what makes it special with a relationship. Mm. You know, and um, so it's how, how do you um, encapsulate that in a, in, in a sort of technology form? You know, to make is it about um, looking at personality types, you know, do introverts prefer extroverts, that sort of thing. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, it's a work in progress that we've not sort of... Uh, I totally agree with you that. because I think there, there's there's been years of siloed algorithmic thinking on these topics and maybe dating apps are guilty of it as well. Of like, if you're compatible on all this criteria, therefore you will love each other for the rest of your lives. And yeah. I think it, it's just a bit, it just engineers out a bit of the sort of humanity of it yeah. and the fact that it's always nice to find out people with different backgrounds. The one thing actually might be quite interesting, uh, well, I'm just spitballing ideas, is people seem to bring up their working week Mm. Quite a lot. It'd be quite interesting to almost um, have that as like a fixed data point because it's it, it's quite interesting to know if somebody's away for three days a week and will largely be in from eight till seven, and it allows me to think about what my expected relationship with them yes. might be yeah. like. Whereas if we when both you're do- free to do weird things, <laughs> <the house>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my flatmate comes back tomorrow, so there'll be no more weirdness in, in my house. But that that's probably one of the big criteria because then I think if somebody's almost like a workaholic it's going to be quite sort of a passive relationship and it'll be a bit come and go and it'll be nice to see them but it doesn't really matter and if somebody's going to be 9 to 5 and I'm 9 to 5 then yeah Yeah, I think lifestyle and expectations yeah uh, yeah definitely and things like um, attitudes to cleanliness and and, and tidiness you know you someone who has to wash up straight after a meal or you someone who likes to you know leave until the next day because actually this it's the trivial stuff like that that can end up <laughs> breaking a flat show mm. rather than <laughs> well the funny thing about those that scoring system the sort of passporting is it's it's a really good system, but I mean, you kind of almost wonder worry about people carrying a black mark around with them for life because they're just dirty and. and <laughs> yeah. Hopefully yeah, would people be honest about that? Exactly. Yeah, it's like, like actually, if three out of three housemates have given you a really bad hygiene score, and you obviously need a chance to be able to re you know, grow yeah. up. Um, so oh yeah, I don't, I don't mean on a scoring system like that, as hmm. in other people scoring more, as in you saying, "I this is what I I'm a dirt I'm bag. Like. I'm a dirt bag. I'm yeah, a dirt I, I need to <laughs> live with other dirt bags." <laughs> there must, presumably, there have been some some sort of horror stories <laughs> that came through to your customer service maybe early on, where you know people were complaining about the people they've moved in with. And, he, and, and on the flip side of that, there must be some really like um, uplifting stories of I don't know people getting married or. Or caring for people, or yeah, we, we we've had a surprising number of spare room weddings. We actually have uh, bought someone's wedding cake for the first one that came through. Uh, we've had to, yeah, also had some uh, spare room babies not long ago. Legitimate, uh, about. yeah, yeah, extra marital babies. Uh, oh, <laughs> very good roommate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, do you, are you happy to share any more of the, the sort of the good stories, all the, all the bad, if you if you're feeling brave? Um, well, we've definitely we've heard sort of businesses that have uh, launched out of uh, flatmate situations. Um, I'm trying to think of any specific examples. Uh, we've, yeah, we've certainly had uh, a share of uh, nightmare stories as well. Um, presumably, you're not liable. You're just sort of no. facilitating the connection, hmm. and then obviously you yeah, care absolutely. you care about it. 
Yeah. But it's like... <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's life. life. No, no, no yeah. amount of compatibility testing or uh, verification and so on can uh, avoid... Well, yeah, it's yeah. strange because flat renting has this unique pressure that it can occasionally bring out someone's true colours. Yeah. Like the, the the things that people will do come the end of a tenancy agreement are quite extraordinary <laughs> in terms of how self serving they'll be. Yeah. Um yeah, and, and no prior history of, of them in their life will prepare you for quite how yeah. selfish they can be yeah. with regard to understanding um, where people it come. It sounds really general, but you're definitely talking about a very specific <laughs> case. Yeah, it may or maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. To no one else. <laughs> I do have a lovely story to share with you from just yesterday, actually. Oh, yeah. I, I had a business meeting with somebody who uh, she came over from China and said somebody on spare room was kind enough to let her room to look for other spare rooms. She said, I didn't actually have a place, but you know, yeah. I'd like to help you out. I live in Richmond. Uh, and they got on so well that she invited uh, the the tenant from China to her family Christmas, and they're now great oh, wow. friends and stay in touch. Yeah, so it obviously facilitates... <laughs> You know more than maybe the, soon. No, they're, 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 no, no. It's, it's an old woman and a, and a young woman, so that would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge too large there for are ways. Current, there are ways. Spare days. rooms, current iterations. <laughs> um, but it's just nice. I mean, and it's clear from your story that there is a sort of humanitarian angle to it. It's it's not just stack them high and yeah, you know, serve them quick. I guess. And actually, you've experienced this firsthand because mm. you yeah. did a. I mean, some people might say it, it looked a bit stunty, but presumably you can. You can say whether that's that's true or not. You you well you you explain it. You know the story I'm referring to. Yeah. So I'd I never used sparing myself. By the time I'd launched it um, and it got going, I was in a long term relationship, and it was actually when that relationship ended in I think it was 2013. Um, I thought actually now is the perfect time to mm-hmm. log on to this yeah, site. Yeah, well, try, try it for myself and and, and get a, a flatmate. Um, so the first time I did it, I, I did it anonymously, and um, and I intended to do it as market research. I, you know, that was my reason to sort of hmm. you know get into the mind of the user. Uh, and in that sense, it was absolutely you know game changing sort of insight. Really, I, you know, I realised, understood the website kind of intellectually, but not emotionally uh, in that way. Um, but I also was surprised to discover that um, I love to share and realize that living with the right people, you know, is better than living on your own. Mm. Um, and, you know, so I, w- I lived with uh, these two flatmates for a, a year and they moved on and... Uh, what was that? You, did t- you did tell them when you were living with them that you were the founder of Spare. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. do it as a stunt or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, both of you, you're getting your accounts deactivated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they moved on and I actually lived for then for six months with a, a friend of a neighbour, which was fantastic as well. Um, and after that, I went to find another couple of flatmates, but decided to do it publicly this time. Because uh, I wanted to sort of tell the story a bit, and uh, and you know promote promote spare room, obviously. Um, so I did a little YouTube web series as well, mm. um, and it was yeah a hugely fun experience. Um, so is that your home? Yeah, the one on the YouTube. Yeah, yeah. it was very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's just really unique, and and that's just what is it? East London, somewhat. Yeah, Spitalfields. Uh, yeah. Can you reveal the dress? <laughs> no, 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 no. I won't do that. Well, actually, because I'm, I'm irate in thinking. Sorry, how sorry. many a- applications did you get when you did that video? Uh, something like seven and a half thousand. Wow, so you can all come. <laughs> <laughs> you can all come, and they could pay what the the, the chosen candidate. I'm right in thinking could pay what they chose to pay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, which I'd, I'd actually already done with the previous flatmates because I didn't want to limit who I lived with uh, with you know by f- with the finances because I, I suppose the market rent around there would be quite high and I wasn't doing it for the money so yeah it was sort of pay what you can afford mm-hmm. um, what would people typically pay when they can afford fair prices um, yeah sort of I think a couple pay around 500 so there's um, nobody going oh here's oh, I'm going to pay 30 quid a month and then I'm also going to be out drinking <laughs> yeah because <no. laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be piss taking a bit <laughs> but yeah so I've got seven and a half thousand applications uh, is, that, is that a record for spare um, only any, for any it wasn't until I went to America and did it there and I got 9,000 there oh, wow. <laughs> that was in New York yeah yeah um, but it was yeah so that was quite a feat getting through those applications so as, as an experience it wasn't quite as um, authentic as the first time I did it mm. because you know I need, uh, yeah I needed a bit of help going through them all, and I also insisted on people uh, putting a video on their profile, which was um, partly 
to help with the sort of YouTube series, but also um, because it's a, a feature of the site which I sort of firmly believe in and kind of transformed the kind of compatibility experience for me. Like the first time, it was all done with messages and advert, you know, the advert text and so on. And I think, oh, they sound like my sort of person. Mm. Um, but the hit rate of kind of meeting them and them being as I expected was quite low. Yeah. Um, whereas when I asked them to put video on there and, and yeah, there were some people doing some, you know, very crazy, fancy videos, but the ones that worked were where they're just talking about nothing to the camera. Yeah. And it really got, gave me a strong sense of whether I'd get on with them. Mm. And, and and actually sort of 90% of the people uh, I sort of saw were like, oh, actually I could live with you. Mm. So it was, yeah, it was a really strong. I guess before it was a bit like a blind date. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's not hard nowadays. Um, we sometimes say with with pitches that mm. I think investors probably want to know who's behind it and often will defer to a phone call. But mm. we, it's very easy to shoot a, a decent quality video on your iPhone now that actually, yeah. even with 20 seconds of footage, you're probably going to know. Yeah, Got a very strong idea about them. From yeah. There. And what was it like living with these internet people? <laughs> internet people. <laughs> 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 No, I mean, thankfully it wasn't like you know Big Brother Ten or whatever. Where you get a load of you know. Freaks. You missed a trick <laughs> yeah. there. You could have spare room does Big yeah. Brother. Yeah. Um, no, I mean they, they were you know you know very genuine, lovely people that I enjoyed living with. Um, Did yeah. you learn something about yourself in terms of what you looked for? But presumably going through that many candidates, you can see what you're you're up yeah, or into, or who the kind of person you you bond with. Yeah, good question. I mean, that's definitely. I mean, in terms of like what what makes a good flatmate, I think you know the shared interest thing. Because I went to, when I first went into it, I, I assumed that that was what was important. So mm. a lot of what I said in my advert, my initial advert, and asked over messages was about what do you do, what do you like to do, uh, and I quickly realised that actually, it, probably that the the heart of it, good rapport was really really important because actually if you don't have a you know if you can't just have a relaxed conversation with someone um which is very hard to define what, how, what, why that happens mm. but otherwise you know it can be very awkward living mm. with someone and constantly passing the hall and having to make polite chit chat so it's sort of <laughs> yeah um so i suppose that was the main thing well one thing i've noticed as well is that people are very culturally unique mm. um that the english can be a little reserved and where you know my dad's australian so I've, yeah. i know plenty of australians they can be more boisterous especially in southwest london yeah. You know, when they're out <laughs> for on their two-year visa, but it's just like there's different intents at different times, and some people want to sort of be a bit more outgoing. Some people, yeah. Yeah, first thing in the morning, don't often have much to say. They just want to yeah, get yeah. to work, and they'll be sociable later. But it's just yeah, and you sort of get to know people's you know uh, ways with that, and kind of. <laughs> and what sort of age groups are we talking? Because when I when I think of spare my kind of, and and I, and I know this isn't true now, but in the past I would have thought it was you know lots of graduates and students looking for, for flat shares but I'm given to understand that's not necessarily the case No, uh, so students are actually a surprisingly small percentage of uh, the people on a site uh, as you might expect the core demographic is 23 to 34 I would say but our biggest growing demographic is the over 40s mm. uh, um, there's a lot of people coming out of long term relationships just as like I did um, who and and often they can't afford to live on their own, or mm. um, you know, because the, the, they've been living together, you know, with two salaries, and they're suddenly on their own. Yeah. So often out of necessity, they share. Sometimes out of just wanting to not be on their own, because mm. you know, it's a great way to sort of rebuild your life, and you know, in a difficult time like that. And I guess the people they would have lived with when they're twenties are, mm. are in long-term relationships. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've seen a rise of weak. Day sharings as well so I think people who mm. live in the countryside and just need somewhere for, for four days yeah yeah that's quite a common thing we've yeah we have a surprising uh, amount of those on the side it's quite effective I mean yeah. I know married couples who have um, a, a, like a big enough house that they yeah. can have somebody for four days a week yeah earn a bit of extra money which is really useful to them and then not have their weekends impacted yeah, yeah. which is yeah surprising quite efficient yeah. yeah definitely and what, what's the raise the roof campaign yeah, so that was a turned out to be a six-year campaign. Uh, we lobbied the government to raise the rent-a-room tax threshold. So previously, um, homeowners looking to rent out to a lodger um, could earn, I think, four thousand two hundred fifty pounds tax-free. 
throughout our room, but that was set back in the 90s. So, you know, a few years ago when we were doing this campaign, it was suddenly not at all, you know, relevant to today's marketplace mm. where, you know, uh, just one room rented out would, in London would, you know, easily go over that. So people were potentially being put off doing it because they thought, oh, God, I have to fill out a tax return. Um, and so, yeah, we lobbied to get that doubled and we finally got it through and it's now uh, seven and a half thousand uh, per year you can earn tax free without having to fill in a tax return. Um, and the hope is that this will encourage more people to uh, rent their rooms because, yeah, we've, we have a housing crisis. But if, you know, there are 19 million empty rooms in the in the England and Wales alone. If we convinced just three percent of them to rent out to a lodger, that would create a virtual city the size of Liverpool. That's crazy. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, so but you know, there's capacity there. It's just you know not utilised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there's any number of. And the weirdest thing is in London, and there's loads of new builds going on, but mm. the house availability still is not not meeting the needs, is it? Yeah. Um, I guess the question is where where are things now at the coalface in terms of your 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 numbers, the scale, how you're growing month on month and yeah. you know year on year at the moment? How are you guys? So we get around two million people using the site every month. Um, still growing, um, not as strongly as in the past, obviously, but it's mm. sort of probably ten percent per year uh, we grow um, in the US. Um, yeah, that's going quite well it's uh, very early days in comparison are you um, in certain areas of the US uh, you can use it anywhere but our focus at the moment is on New York LA and Miami mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what's what's the playbook there for going to the US because it'd probably be very useful for people to listen in um, in terms of how you size that up and, and decided to deploy in certain areas um, and, and what it's been like actually executing on that uh, so we chose New York for the, the obvious sort of parallels with London. London's up by far our biggest market here, um, and you know, sort of made it. You know, it's sort of New York, given its size and its uh, um, competitiveness for sort of uh, for housing and the expense of it, um, flat sharing is as normal there as it is here. Um, and similar to here, we, we have a sort of country style service that's the incumbent Craigslist, obviously, um, and you know, people have the same problems with that. Um, there with um, just you know needle in a haystack really there's sort of so much stuff on there a lot of it's spam there's a lot of scammers on there so nutters yeah <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you deal with that um, we have uh, a, a various sort of automated uh, systems for trying to flag sort of suspicious Behavior, and then we have a you know a huge moderation team who you know manually go through and, and check people out. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, but was it? I mean, was it intimidating going to the US? Do you feel like how do you get your first customers, or just had reputation spread from the UK from people going? There's to There's a little bit of that. I mean, when we launched, we've actually sort of had two launches there. We we first tried to um, launch there in 2011, and decided to basically replicate a lot of the steps we took in the UK. Uh, we did speed roommating event as we called it there mm -hmm. um, and got a ton of press I think for every week for about five weeks we were on a TV station there and, and sadly it didn't really translate into uh, any additional momentum particularly on, on the on the site um, SEO we struggled with that in the early days getting some momentum with that but then but then it sort of caught on but we sort of other things took over in the UK and we sort of ended up leaving on the back burner a little bit and then sort of relaunched in uh, 2016 and yeah it was it was certainly daunting especially given the kind of unexpectedly slow progress to begin with but uh, we relaunched the events um, I ended up moving out there which helped in sort of the publicity around me getting roommates um, Donald Trump was president yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah that really got in the way of some of the press we did actually <laughs> unfortunately that was bigger news so yeah <laughs> fake news <laughs> but, but, but growth is strong because presumably this, I mean, that could be an enormous market for you if you really stamp yourself yeah. on it yeah yeah I think yeah we're doing pretty well we've, you know, we've got stiff competition there uh, but we're, you know we're, 
the signs are the signs are good. And it, it is the, the good early signs is good inventory and, and people bring yeah. up good rooms. That's a fa- that's essentially the main sort of metric we, we we look at is yeah number of rooms. And what's your position on sort of the Airbnb and and uh, one fine stay thing of just high quality photography? Is that so important? Do you care that much? Because sometimes there's a sort of dingy looking room and I think somebody's not done themselves a service. But I know the location of something is fine. But yeah, I mean it's I mean. Certainly, the ones with, with good quality photographs, are, you know, inevitably do better. But in terms of us, um, sort of funding that, which I know Airbnb did, it's just it doesn't work with our business model. I mean, Airbnb, when they get a, a room on there or a flat, it's on there all the, basically permanently. It's yeah, like true. A, mm. it's like a hotel or whatever. Whereas with us, it's a, it's just you know, after three weeks, it's gone, and then someone will be living there for a year or two. Yeah. Um, and also in terms of uh, our business model, we don't earn a lot from each individual because we don't get involved with the transaction um, it's you know a lot of people use it for free so it's very hard to sort of uh, <laughs> to scale um, but you must have sort of interesting um, data on people's sort of migratory habits in terms of how far the average person is willing to move from where their current location is and stuff like that so do you do you guys get some good insights into people's behavioural patterns with flat sharing yeah we, we uh, yeah, we, there is an enormous amount of data there we don't, haven't actually sold any of it yet that, mm. yet, which I think could be another sort of revenue stream that we haven't looked into yet. Because if somebody could give their place of work and their mm. their where they live, so for instance, now I work in Parsons Green and I live in Putney Bridge, mm. um, pff, my move's going to be very local. Yeah. And I just wonder if there's ways that you can start to contextualise where I'm willing to go. Like I'm not going to go to East London just to make my commute yeah. way more. Um, it might be quite interesting. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, we don't. I mean, we don't take people's Thanks. places of work. So. <laughs> 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 um, and and beyond New York. I mean, you said, are you finding California different to... Yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's growing at a different pace. I think, I mean, LA is a a very different, you know, city in its size and, you know, it's much more spread out, obviously. Um, And in terms of the competition, because paid search is, you know, one of our key ways to get traffic and, and users. And so in New York, it's so competitive. So it's very expensive to, you know, acquire users, whereas LA, it's not so much. Uh, Miami again even less competitive so so we're sort of we're doing it in three cities to sort of I don't know learn the differences and try and yeah come up with a formula for uh, uh, for launching in other cities does it help having a big brand name from the UK because presumably they that means nothing to them yeah I don't I mean sure there'll be some yeah people from the UK and and vice versa but uh, there's not much awareness so it's not really helped in that sense it's kind of back to basics but yeah you, you're, well, you're leveraging lessons that you've learned before. yeah exactly yeah what's uh, quite interesting as well is that you guys to your to your credit haven't gone the easy jet cross sell model which you could have done every time somebody moves somewhere you could constantly bombard them with all the offers of things that they could buy you know yeah. their, their removal vans broadband packages and stuff like that i mean i would never begrudge that is that going to be part of your strategy to help people have this sort of easy clean yeah. um, move if they want it I mean, we've we've dabbled in that stuff before, but it's it it didn't it didn't seem particularly well received. I mean, right, I, I can imagine that. Um, and I know as a customer, I mean, I hate being bombarded with all that stuff that's not relevant to what I'm doing. Yeah. And and also these days with GDPR, it'd be very hard to to do that anyway because you know our sort of permissions in terms of the emails we send is about legitimate interest for the the, the service that we're providing. Right. And that would I think be a bit on the borderline that (laughs) no I agree there's a certain goodwill that comes through spare room and I think you're right if you're constantly trying to eke extra pennies out of people then maybe that can evaporate quite quickly yeah and that was the other thing about the sort of data side of things as well why we've always sort of steered a little bit away from that you know we've always promised our user look we we will never sell your data or you know know, we respect your privacy and everything else because we want to be we'll treat them as we want to be treated ourselves Mm. and is the ultimate ambition to be a global Solution, yeah, yeah, yeah. We do, yeah. It's definitely a, we see ourselves as a global brand mm-hmm. eventually, yeah. And would you ever sell the company? Um, so what's it's been a twenty-year project? Yes, yeah, well, yeah, I suppose so. Since the very since beginnings you of the, it, yeah. the first kernel of the yeah, idea, yeah, yeah, it has. Um, I, I've considered it before. I've been approached a few times, yeah, but uh, um, 
no plans at the yeah. moment, and I can't quite imagine it. I sort of, I, I love being part of it. Uh, you kind just of, have to go back to Erogenous Jane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can worry what I do. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can just force the success of the company at that point with just a huge, huge budget. Yeah. And and how involved are you now? I mean, presumably you have quite a, a big team. Yeah, there's probably about eighty people in total. Right. Um, most of them are in Manchester, where mm-hmm. I'm spending more time now. Um, I was a little less, day, you know, involved in the day to day for a while, but um, I'm now a bit more involved on the product side, particularly. Okay. Um, and so, know. is there a, a CEO? And um, so, uh, Gemma is kind of, I suppose, the COO. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, you know, effectively, does a lot of yeah. CEO style stuff, and. and I'm my official title's MD, but uh, right. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> but as in, you haven't like appointed, you haven't no. brought someone in from outside no. to run it. No, right, okay. And I'm guessing, without the external backing, your ability to make decisions autonomously and without as much stress is probably vastly improved. You can just answer yeah. to yourselves. Which... Really, can't. yeah, yeah, exactly. We can sort of answer to our customers and ourselves, and you know, mm. no one else. You know have a conflict of interest with it it's really yeah because it could liberating. be a, a, quite an like an ugly business if it was driven purely by venture growth demanding yeah. that metrics are, are accelerated yeah. year on year to get a unicorn valuation you could see them just doing awful stuff to make you guys grow as quickly as possible <laughs> yeah. um i guess the flip side of that is you wonder if not necessarily at the start but if maybe you know three or four years ago you'd mm. accepted a big venture round whether this the, the global ambition would have happened quickly yeah 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 yeah, um, uh, we saw so yeah. Rumi is a, a, a our sort of New York competitor, and they had a huge amount of investment, and they managed to spend it all very quickly yeah. on a lot of expensive advertising. Yeah, um, they're not really catching wind in the UK. Again, I've used no. them just to have a peek, but there wasn't much on there. Yeah, because um, I guess we could. There's an analogy we could. We interviewed um, Julian Hearn, who's the ha- founder of Fuel. Hmm. Have you heard of Fuel? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and he started the business with no investment, mm. and then, and he ran it for. He started it in 2015, mm. and we had him on the podcast last this last time last year. Yeah. And he, then he hadn't raised any money up to that point. And immediately after the podcast, they did 20 million from one large investor, and it was just to, because they wanted to accelerate their yeah. their, their global yeah. expansion strategy. I mean, it's something we've considered like since we, uh, moving to the US, but it's sort of figuring out how best that money would be deployed to actually in, you know increase that growth yeah um because it was in, i always worry about growing too quickly in terms of personnel that, yeah. that can get out of control you lose quickly control of the culture yeah, yeah totally and we've had you know over the years you know the odd cultural problem and mm-hmm. you know through hiring so that would be you know something i'd be nervous about um and also just yeah how how to accelerate the growth in terms of the user base having seen Roomy attempt it with subway advertising and so on because ultimately there's there's only ever going to be a certain number of people in market any one time mm-hmm. so it's quite, you know it's quite a challenge. Do you have any particular idiosyncrasies at the spare room employee culture? Of the, the culture, you say? Yeah, so like uh, ways that you would attract people to work there. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, I think we're very very friendly, mm-hmm. relaxed place. Mm-hmm. I think. Um, what else? But I, I mean, do you do any of the sort of maybe gimmicky startup things and like? I uh, always, I don't know. I, I, I find the kind of tech kind of yeah. you know thing a bit a bit cliche, yeah. a bit cringy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, trying to avoid that. But um, you know, we do some fun stuff like we for our last for our we had our fifteenth birthday mm-hmm. celebrations the other month, and uh, we organised a mini festival. That's in, cool. In a field near our Manchester office, which was. Virgin really Jones, good. <laughs> yeah. 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 back to back <laughs> sets. <laughs> we were asked to play. But, uh, <laughs> they were busy. They were booked yeah. <laughs> in the US, perhaps. Um, do you? But, and, and so, would you ever go? I think the slightly strange. Re- I will slag off company now. The we work. We're going to own your lifestyle. Re- have you ever thought of, of a spare office or anything, or some kind of <laughs> enterprise addition to what you do, or is that not? No, I mean, we're trying to think like oh, what things can we add on to spare to kind of you know because there's a spare lot of spare tire. Yes. <laughs> 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 well, there's a lot of um, short-term requirement for for flats, and I'm not really sure how it's done at the moment by whoever's in HR at these big companies. But somebody from Deloitte in New York may want to come to the London for three months, and mm. um, it seems they're willing to have a fairly ludicrous budget. So I'm yeah. told. But I just wonder if you ever looking into sort of a 
enterprisey or, or spare office type space, or is this not not of interest? Um, no, not really. I mean, we've sort of yeah, we've started side projects in the past, and it's just it, you know both suffer. You know, the main spare room and mm. the side project because you yeah. just. You can, better to focus on one thing really. but what you could do is start a sort of spare room property portfolio and do like little like spare room communes where all the rooms yeah. in the commune are, are advertised in spare room well like the collective it, right so there's some i guess there's some collective housing schemes now where you you have a nice room and it's it's done up to like a nice spec but there's sort of a communal kitchen yeah, sort of yeah. co-living I suppose, yeah co-living, exactly yeah we have yeah we have been looking into um creating a co-living space starting owning assets so if you guys yeah. are a cash rich business and you're not necessarily yeah. going to turn that on to equity then then purchasing of property assets might I yeah don't know. but and doing a cool a cool yeah thing with your it. own thing with it where yeah. there's a trusted brand behind the quality and service especially if those little like egypts are on there doing their property management companies within your organization it's like yeah. well <laughs> you guys could probably do a way better job than than they're yeah. doing but it just made me think of, of schemes like um, in Amsterdam or Holland, they have students who obviously not cash rich but need accommodation, mm. um, and then older people who are retired and they need someone to look after them, and they have them living together. Oh yeah, like and, and it yeah. sort of intensifies that the students get money off because they're spending time looking after the older people. Yeah, yeah, we we we, we did a buy the domain senior spare room once for that purpose actually. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, I think that sort of naturally happens anyway on the site. Right, sort of, okay. All these sort of niche um, sort of situations like that. So. Interesting. Are you at all lured by Europe as a as a destination? Europe's a weird one, isn't it? Because there was that big problem with Airbnb where it was more um, profitable to just put something on Airbnb for seven days than it was to rent it out for a month. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on Europe? Yeah, I mean, certainly with Airbnb, that's our, you know, they're not a competitor, but that's where we're seeing it eat into parts of our market is where it's luring away people who might have rented by the room and it's actually more profitable to you know do a holiday let um to be honest it's more of a practical decision as well in the sort of short term where we go next in that our platform wasn't set up for other languages, languages yeah. <laughs> so, yeah which uh we you know i think i don't think it would be a huge job to move over to that but we might that might affect our decision for the sort of next spot, depending on where how quickly we um, yeah. decide. To Even the on. name spare room doesn't yeah, mean exactly. in French. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, thankfully, but, you know, the, there's a lot of English speakers. They will probably get what it means. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and a question on you, you personally. Um, you've been involved, but it's quite interesting hearing your thing that you're not that sort of into the sort of generic startup tech culture. Um, have you ever considered angel investments into interesting startups you've seen? Are there any companies that have got you excited and thought, oh, actually, I wouldn't have minded backing them and and either bringing them under the spare room umbrella as a small acquisition or, or just angel vesting yourself? Uh, I have dabbled in it recently. Um, I invested in a, in a company called Knock for Sale, which you know isn't a million miles from, you know, it's in the property area. And the, the concept is bringing online this, this uh, the idea of sending, writing handwritten notes through doors to say, oh, if you ever think of selling. Um, so this would be, uh, enable people to do it sort of on mass, so I say if it was a young family looking for to look in a certain, live in a certain area, which might be you know a difference of a few streets between their children going to the school they want them to do go to and so on. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that was approached through a friend of mine and thought it seemed like a interesting idea. Mm. Um, but I yeah, I'm not sure whether I, it's something I'm going to continue to do a lot of just because I find actually it sort of takes up. A reasonable amount of time, and yeah, again, it's sort of about focus and actually. <laughs> yeah, if you're still full time yeah. engaged and spare room. Yeah. Um, do you really do a quick, quick fire question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, do you have a prediction for the future for us? Well, I'd like to think there's going to come a day where the people will stop aspiring to living on their own. Um, it seemed like sort of sharing was a bit of a sort of poor cousin of renting, and yeah. that poor cousin of uh, buying. Um, I I think people will start to see the benefits of sharing more and more, to the, and especially as we've got a, a real epidemic of loneliness at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, nine, million, nine million people in the UK say they're lonely either most of the time or often. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we all like to share experiences. Uh, uh, you know, there's a sort of cliche now about you know, um, it's almost like an experience didn't happen unless they shared on social media, but I think that's, you know, at the core of it. There's just a need to share experiences with other people, and, you know, when you live with people, you... Yeah, you know, having that di- down, so. diversity of experiences. Yeah, really yeah, which make up a good life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a life well lived and and 
yeah. be right experience and have stories about yeah. it. Um, what about a book that you'd recommend? Um, I would recommend. So I suppose the book that's had one of the, one of the books that had the most influence on me over the years was uh, "Don't Make Me Think," which uh, was based about UX on the web. Okay. And you know, it's it's an old, a bit of an old book now, and probably the examples are out of date. But I think the sort of philosophy and principle behind it is still very relevant and underpins, you know, good UX. Um, and I th- and I think especially today it's very relevant because I think you know a lot of the UX these days is sort of you know, super sleek and super simple mm-hmm. at the expense of being obvious how to work okay, something. You know, uh, you know, f- feature discovery and feature tools are kind of like become the norm now. Whereas, is that just bad UX if you've got to explain it? If it's, right. you know, if I've got to find out something by trial and error or yeah. be shown a video, then it's not okay. obvious enough. You know, I went into a toilet in, I think it was Gatwick Airport recently that had a video. Uh, explaining how to use the hand dryer. I thought that's a shit hand dryer. Yeah. 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 Well, it's true though. How to pee? Well, there's like the, there's the, the beautiful sort of Japanese art of, of like making things minimalistic and, and stripping back the experience. And yeah, it needs it needs a lot of thinking sometimes to yeah. get that right as well. It's not like a, me, it's sometimes like, people go on a website and think mm, it's really simple. It's like sometimes there's been a lot of thinking into hell. Yeah. Mind you, I used a Japanese loo recently that had a heated seat. Oh yeah, yeah. And all the, all the controls and. Yeah. <laughs> Hoses. Yeah, wow. you get hosed yeah. by yeah. accident if you're not yeah. careful. Exactly. I didn't have a clue how to use it. I was actually terrified of it. <laughs> I can't even picture this. Yeah, it was, it was weird. Um, what about the best <coughs> advice you've ever been given? Um, I'm not sure if this is it's probably a bit niche and just specific to me, and not necessarily <laughs> so other people can, you know, take away. But uh, you know, I said that the that I started charging five pound lifetime membership. Mm. Uh, my dad's friend was over one day for dinner and. And I was saying, oh, you know, I'm starting to really make some money out of this. So why don't why don't you make just make it like a week long membership rather than a lifetime? Then you get renewals. And I was like, oh yeah, that's quite an obvious <laughs> suggestion, but it made a world of it's difference. True. Has he reaped any royalties from this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. make sure keep quiet about that. That's yeah. just like uh, Sean Parker removed the the in the Facebook moment, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But I suppose uh, one that was a bit more general that people other people can take. I suppose is I don't know where I got it from, but. Um, just uh, about if you follow the herd, sort of by definition, you're only going to get average results. So it's sort of I don't mm-hmm. know, about questioning conventional wisdom, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and finally, given that you're so open to to sharing your living space, if <laughs> if, if Ed and I and the podcast listeners could invite two people to dinner for you at your flat, who would they be? <laughs> they ha- they obviously have to be real and alive. I'd invite Gandalf, but if I could. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! So I, I, I did have someone dead to choose, but okay, I'll have you, can, you can name them. You can mention the dead guy. <laughs> um, so I guess my first one was actually inspired by I went out for dinner with an old school friend last night, who I shared a room with pretty much every term, uh, and we were case in point in terms of the you know shared interest, not necessarily you know being the making of a compatible relationship because we used to hate each other's music taste to the point that right. we had a music timetable. And we used to torment each other, you know, playing the music that each other hated the most. Like he'd play terrible 80s Genesis. <laughs> and I played the craziest part of Frank Zappa's repertoire. So he, <laughs> he could possibly be one of my uh, dinner guests if I could. <laughs> I mean, he was interesting on many levels. I suppose from a bringing it back to business, uh, I, I imagine he would have some interesting thoughts on productivity. Mm. I've never struggled with a motivation or drive, but he took it to a whole new, you know, another level. Um, he produced like 110 albums in his time, so it's wow. just like absolutely staggering. Um, in terms of a living person, um, I travel every week on Virgin Trains, go up and down to London, Manchester. So I'd quite like to give Richard Branson some feedback, you know, about, <laughs> about the experience. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I'm all for a strong and fun brand, but, you know, being talked to by the toilet gets old pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, and I also want to give him a suggestion about a new carriage called Working Class, which is like first class, but where you don't have the endless deafening in, uh, interruptions from announcements and, and people serving you tea and stuff, so you can actually get some oh, work nice, done. Nice, <laughs> nice. That is a good idea. That is You're a really good idea. The punny days of the <laughs> Rogerness <laughs> Jones. Yeah. I had to say it one more time on <laughs> <in> the podcast. <laughs> Well, he's also, I mean, interesting guy. I saw a documentary on Virgin Atlantic flight about his transatlantic balloon flight, and I'd never quite realised what a staggering, death-defying 
feet that was extraordinary dangerous wasn't yeah, it yeah, and didn't have, his engineer or somebody it. climb up oh, actually he had to do some ridiculous stunt to try and yeah, save them yeah. it was yeah. really quite close yeah and what an incredible publicity stunt really for, you know, uh, I'm, for t- I'm terrified of hot air balloons I just think they're <laughs> oh me too <laughs> yeah and that made it even even worse yeah. um so we get Richard Branson. Is there another person we can add, or was it just you head to head, heads up with? <laughs> shoot, I shoot, we, could have, we could have a go at getting Richard Branson. Oh, we'll certainly we? try. <laughs> uh, who else? Uh, we'll get the, the ghost of Frank Zappa. <laughs> <laughs> Played by a poorly paid extra from drama school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe the bassist from Iron Maiden. Cool. <laughs> Just, I mean, uh, I mean, again, an- another incredible story about how you know he had such a strong vision and and how, yeah, he, he they went through about twenty different uh, formations before sort of finalising on their singer and the perfect sound, and they've just defied sort of convention as well in terms of how they promoted themselves. You know, at the time where you had to have a hit single and and so on, he, they just sort of kicked away and stuck to their you know their values and just their merchandise machine is quite impressive yeah. as well just you know people have tattoos of them on them so I mean if you think about it, in that sense it's like, a, you yeah. know, it's like a Harley Davidson so you know I, know I used to be a fan when I was a kid but uh. that's, that's pretty cool <laughs> that's pretty cool yeah um, and the last thing we'd like to ask and this may be a simple one for, for our audience is if there's anything they can do to help you on your, your journey forward what would that be? I guess I'd be intrigued to find out who, you know, any success stories with sharing. Just as we were saying earlier about the kind of the sort of strange stories you hear and the people that, uh, that, that that get together there and start businesses and so on. And I suppose if, you know, this is mainly entrepreneurs listening to this, I'd be intrigued to hear what success stories in terms of businesses that came out of I bet flat there have been. experience. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. uh, we sort of love to tell these stories to, to you know, to, you know, again, sort of show people. Well, and to show you sometimes that your hard work is, and we, yeah. our RMDs love it when somebody says, we've got fundraised through your platform. It makes a big yeah. difference to their life. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. It's been really good. <laughs> so much really fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure.